Okay, so everyone done with their conversations? Great. Uh, so my name is Kate Chapman. I'm the Chief Technology Officer of the Cadasta Foundation. And I'm going to be talking about when data doesn't belong in OpenStreetMap, the land tenure use case. So first off, a little bit about what Cadasta is. Uh, we're a relatively new organization. We're working towards a future where through technology and partnerships, property rights are recognized and protected throughout the world. I joined Cadasta full time, I think it was seven weeks ago now. Um, we're a small team, uh, five of us just starting on this journey to build this platform. And the reason is 80% uh, of the world does not have secure land rights. So you can imagine, if you think about that in population, how many billions of people that is. And I guess one of the things that I've learned quite a bit, um, because I don't come from a land, sector, section, uh, land background, is what does that really mean? Uh, another uh, way to break it down is 4.2 billion people in urban slums don't have the rights to where they live. Um, and what that means is if you don't have the rights to where you live, you can't really control your own destiny. You know, you could be evicted, you could be kicked out. Um, and it, so it doesn't enable you to be secure at all. Uh, and that's, of course, not the only type of right, though. So to give a little background, um, so in talking about property rights and land tenure, there's other things to have the rights to, like the rights to mine for minerals or to choose to chop down trees or not in your forest, grazing right away, meaning you can traverse through a property. Um, and there's, then there's also ones that I never really thought about at, at all until I joined the team recently. Uh, one of the ones is having the rights to the fruits that fall from a tree, but not being able to pick them off the tree. Um, that's a type of land right. So we're not just talking about homes and where people live, but also potential livelihoods. And so I'm at State of the Map US, so why am I here and how does OpenStreetMap relate to this? Well, I've been heavily involved in OpenStreetMap since, uh, I got involved in 2009 and heavily involved since about 2010, 2011. So when I look at land, land uh, issues, I come from it from a geographer and technologist lens. And I think that we can learn a lot from OpenStreetMap. And Rather than starting anew, um, Cadastra is starting to build a technology platform. We can look at how OpenStreetMap is set up and what's appropriate for some of these land-related issues and what's not. I think one of the greatest things is the flexible data schema. So one of the things that when GIS people come to OpenStreetMap that really blows their mind is they're used to thinking in tables and like very traditional database um, situations. And the thing is, when you're looking at things like land, as I talked about, and you need to say, okay, there's a tree here, but also this person has the right to pick the fruits, but this other person has the ones that fall on the ground, and this other person has the right to a shade, the shade there. And that can change by region and culture. And in OpenStreetMap, when you say, okay, I want to map this thing that's never been mapped before, it's flexible enough that you can say, okay, I'm gonna go and do this. And I think it's important to learn from that because trying to apply a very ri rigid schema doesn't work if you're building an international global platform. It, I, don't, I don't think OpenStreetMap would be as successful today as it, as it is without that flexibility. The other big thing, and I think also um, strength, is the detailed historic information, like that, all that history. So picturing if you have a piece of land and you sell it, and then maybe you split it, you need to, and say so you need to go back to how it originated, having all that information. And I think OpenStreetMap does this quite well, because other ways of storing historic data is really complicated. In OpenStreetMap, it's really, you're just saying, this is the lineage of it, and it's kept, and it's very detailed. I would have only said robust until a couple of years ago, but I think we can call the editing tools easy now as well with ID and with uh, 
tools like OpenMapKit coming along. And the thing is, there's no reason to build from scratch. Uh, I think really a lot can be learned from those tools. Uh, I also think the conflict resolution is interesting with an OpenStreetMap, and there's two levels of it. Um, there's the technical conflict resolution, and then there's the um, community conflict resolution. And, and the editing conflicts works pretty well right now, though not distributed in OpenStreetMap. But then the social side of it, I think we do still have difficulty with. Um, Sometimes, but there is the flexibility to say, in my language, I call this place this, in your language, you call it that, rather than fighting for that one name. And sometimes in resolving land dispute information, it's more deciding to share and in what way you're going to share. And then I think community is something really to think about. Um, and, you know, being able to document and being able to build your own map, um, that's part of documenting as well. So with Cadasta, we're looking at both building a map you know, of land rights, but also the other associated documentation. And you know, I'm a huge fan of OpenStreetMap, and my first inclination when looking at problems is, how does it fit into OpenStreetMap, or can we use the OpenStreetMap tools? But in thinking through it in this particular case, I really didn't feel like that was the option, uh, it was a good option. And the reason for that were a couple things. Um, those that are deeply involved in OpenStreetMap, or maybe even not that deeply, um, are aware of the on-the-ground principle, which in researching this presentation, it turns out it's not that well documented. There's a couple examples of it in the wiki but you just don't go to a page that says on the ground rule and you're like, oh, there's the on the ground rule. And, but what this means is that you, you're mapping concrete things that you can see most of the time. You're not mapping opinion, you're mapping facts. And the exception to that is we do allow certain types of boundaries into OpenStreetMap. But every so often someone comes along and wants to map, uh, import all of the property boundaries for a place, um, and all the individual um, property boundaries, and what comes up is, well, you can't verify those to go maintain them. And so the on the ground rule gets pointed to. And so with this, I don't think OpenStreetMap is necessarily the right place for mapping this, because we're mapping things that could be a little bit of opinion. Like if you go, go to a community and decide what, the, what their uh, land claims were, it's a little fuzzy, it's a little bit of opinion. If they were to eventually get legal status, then it starts to be a fact. But we're starting with things with informal communities where it's not a fact yet. So that doesn't really relate, that doesn't relate well to OpenStreetMap. Then there's privacy concerns. Um, I've done some work previously when I worked for the humanitarian OpenStreetMap team in linking public OpenStreetMap data to private information. We created a tool called the Private Data Store, which allowed you to have additional tags attached to a feature. And the reason we did it is we were, I was working with communities that were doing household level surveys. And so knowing how many stories their building was and what it was made of, that could be public. But knowing their blood type and their annual income and their national ID number and all that stuff, you know, really doesn't belong there. And it's the same with land. There's those pieces that maybe you don't want them to be public. Or maybe if you're working with vulnerable communities, putting that out public is gonna cause someone to go, oh, that's some great land. It would be really easy to go take that. So there's a lot of privacy concerns. Um, and what we're thinking through is what can be open and how can we help people make informed decisions about what can be open. And so with OpenStreetMap, um, that really isn't an option, you know, it's open. And, um, and in thinking about importing data into OpenStreetMap, we do import data, but the ty type of data, as I was mentioning, property boundary type data, it's really not what the community generally is accepting as commonly wanted in the database. So, I was thinking about OpenStreetMap as a platform, though, 
because there's multiple instances now of where people set up their own OpenStreetMap stack and map their own types of data. Does that work for us? Possibly, uh, but in looking at it more deeply, for what we're trying to do, and it pains me to say this, we want things to be less mappy. And what I mean by that is knowing what, where things are as far as geography is important, but recording information such as existing legal documents or making a video testimony um, of people's historic land-related information, um, I guess we could fork OpenStreetMap and add that ability, but it's still very map-centric. So we're thinking through the designs of how are we going to deal with this data and it won't be so mappy. Um, but I did want to do a little bit of a pitch for Sajed's talk tomorrow. Um, OpenStreetMap software for more than OpenStreetMap. If you were looking for sort of an OpenStreetMap as a platform talk, um, he's going to be talking about multiple use cases, but Moabi is a specific one related to land. Um, and what it does is it's an initi initiative in the Democratic Republic of Congo to map resource information. And it uses the OpenStreetMap stack, a separate set of servers, to do this. So why am I here? Um, well, I would probably be here at the conference either way, but why am I standing on stage? Uh, we're still excited about participating in the OpenStreetMap community, and it's not just because they hired me, and if you hire me, the OpenStreetMap community comes along, uh, but because <laughs> uh, there's other parts we're interested in. So remember all that on-the-ground stuff? That's still re really important, that on-the-ground rule. So those on-the-ground features that the OpenStreetMap community is mapping are important. I mean, just simply for having a map that's referenceable. Um, so let's say you're somewhere and you want to draw out the community's boundaries. You don't really start with a blank piece of paper. You would start with satellite imagery or maybe with an existing map. OpenStreetMap very much could be a part of that. Also, we really love the OpenStreetMap tools. There's a lot of tools within OpenStreetMap that are used heavily that have other uses. I think Field Papers is a great use of this. And so who here has used Field Papers for something? OK, a decent amount. And for those who maybe are are newer to the community. Open, uh, field Papers allows you to print out a map, draw on it, and then you can take a picture of it with your phone and then upload it, and it's geo-referenced, so you can use it as a base for digitizing and editing information. And this com combination of low-tech and high-tech can be really great with interacting with communities. I'd like to see Field Papers become more modularized, so we, instead of saying to people, go to field papers to do this task, and then go over here to do this task, and then do this, be able to insert uh, the, the field papers workflow into existing mapping applications, or in our case, a mapping application that doesn't exist yet, but we really like, the, like this, uh, like field papers. And then there's open map kit. Uh, Dale Kuntz from the American Red Cross is speaking tomorrow about this. Open Map Kit is a fork of Open Data Kit. So Open Data Kit is a robust mobile data collection tool that works offline um, and, and, and just does field collection of data really well. And in OpenStreetMap, I feel like we have lots of choices for field data collection, but um, they either do one thing really well or they do all the things not particularly well. And Open Map Kit is something that's coming out of a project that's used for doing difficult data collection in many parts of the world. So adding better geography to this. Um, and so I'm really excited for that, where that's going to go. Also, uh, with a lot of the non-governmental organizations we've been talking to, one of their big things is imagery. You know, a lot of people think, oh, well, we have Google Earth. We can go zoom in and look at our house. And 
it, that's sort of taken for granted. But if you, you know, trace something off of Google Earth, then who owns that tracing? Do you have the right to release that data? Um, similar to, you know, OpenStreetMaps not using that imagery. We can use Bang or we can use Mapbox. And what if your area doesn't have high re resolution imagery yet? How do, how do you get that? And so I'm really excited um, about another project, Open Aerial Map, which just launched in beta a couple weeks ago. And Open Aerial Map is tools that sit on top of the open imagery network that allow you to search, for, uh, search through imagery and use that imagery. And I think you know, as imagery becomes lower and lower, lower cost, um, we need easier ways for people to be able to use it. There's a birds of a feather at 3.30 after this for open aerial map, by the way, if that sounds exciting. So did any of this sound interesting to you? Uh, I'd love to talk more. I always talk about open street map, but I'm also interested in learning um, what other people are doing related to land. I do find a lot of people in the open street map community that are thinking about these things, but it's not something we talk about in the core part of OSM. And then a little pitch as well. Uh, I'm going to be building out our engineering team over the next three or four months. So if you're interested in working on some cool problems on a small team where you can work remotely, and we like to have a lot of fun, uh, come talk to me. And thank you. Any questions? So the question was, where do you get the imagery? Um, getting imagery is actually somewhat complicated. So from the OpenStreetMap lens, OpenStreetMap gets imagery through either open government imagery. There's a right to use Bing Maps imagery to trace, as also Mapbox and a couple other things. Um, if I was working with a community somewhere where there wasn't any freely available imagery, typically we would purchase it. Um, and that's going through an imagery provider or reseller. Um, it can be significantly expensive. Uh, if you had access to drones, you could potentially take it yourself, do it yourself. Uh, the pub public labs is another group that does balloon and kite mapping. So there are low cost ways to make it yourself. Um, what part of my uh, speaking about open aerial map is actually we're seeing more and more with more use of drones that people actually do have imagery for some places, but they don't know what to do with it because it's a lot of data and either you don't know anyone else would be interested in it or you just want it to be easy. You know, you wanted to go, f you wanted to go fly your drone and be done with it. So <laughs> anyone else? Heather. Is it on? I think so. Um, so you mentioned ground truthing. So what do you envision with that? So are you building the technology first? Or are you working in specific areas or regions? Yeah, so we're doing both. Um, we don't want to be everywhere. We want to build technology in a platform people can use and enable them to, to um, grab it and go, you know. And, but we also recognize we need to do pilots, we need to work through it, and we need to make sure that that works. Frank, wave to everyone. Frank's my coworker. Uh, he's in charge of our programs. So, he, so whereas I'm in charge of the technology, Frank's in charge of working with those groups, uh, making sure the technology works for them, and making sure they know about Cadasta and how we can help. Hello. Hi. I'm, I like how you distinguish between uh, what should be private data and what should be open data, particularly in the protection of land rights and social rights. And so in some senses, you have um, private data that's maybe socioeconomic uh, or related to health, et cetera, and, and that you know, should remain in the private realm and be protected. I'm curious. Uh, I like how Cadasta looks at historical data on um, um, protection and display of that in maps. And I'm curious, how do you think that um, 
by perhaps making land rights and land ownership more transparent and more public can be actually serve as a tool to cement people into land ag agreements and protect them. Um, so I guess, in short, that would be it. I, th I think it's actually, so the question um, for the AV team was that how does making land information transparent um, actually help solidify those rights? I think it, it's gonna, definitely going to depend on the scenario. I think there's situations where saying, hey, we're here, brings attention to it and protects people. But then there's those other scenarios where saying, hey, we're here, people think, oh, we didn't know you were here. You know? uh, and I think it's just going to depend on the specific contest, context, whether doing public advocacy helps. Um, I think within OpenStreetMap specifically, if you look at projects like the Map Kybera project, it, which is a project to work on mapping the largest, uh, the largest uh, slum in Kenya in Nairobi, where putting people on the map shows that that land wasn't just a park. Many, many people lived there. There were thriving businesses and schools. And so that type of advocacy can work in some places. But I think it just will depend on the legal and social structure of the indiv individual place. Uh huh. Actually, allows for uh, conflicts to arise over land ownership, and I think that transparency is one of the strongest keys, actually, in any municipality uh, or any region uh, in the global south. And so, it, and, I mean, any municipality really is looking to recognize those land rights. And so, I would just really point out that I think that that's important to make that process transparent, almost in any case where you have a municipal landowner that recognizes property rights of individuals. I think. Um in making property rights transparent, it really, though, would depend on the government and what the government is trying to do. Because um, I think it could go two ways. Like, if the government is looking to formalize people, documenting, formalize their rights, documenting it could help with the government. I suppose you could work the other way and kind of shame the government. But is there some in-between where the outcome's not great? Governments look to plan anyway, services. We can talk back in Portland. Cool. <laughs> and I don't. I think I'm out of time. Uh, thank you, everyone. <laughs>